Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Encouraging you to live as an ambassador of God's kingdom in the world. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles. Arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise. By your power, we will go. By your spirit, we are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. How does your garden grow? Good morning. I am Carmen LaBerge. This is Mornings with Carmen. If your name is Mary, this message is directly for you. Oh, no, no. It's really really for you if your name's not Mary. How does your garden grow? You may be saying to yourself, it's the middle of winter. It's uh, no no garden growing here. Aha. Aha. Uh, How does the garden of your heart grow today? Like, how does it grow? Who is the gardener? What is the soil? What is the seed? You get in enough living water, the light of God's love. Do you recognize God as the gardener? Is there some pruning that needs to be done? Maybe it's time for God to till the soil of your of your heart. So Mary Mary, quite contrary. If you're feeling anxious or depressed or contrarian of spirit today, how does your garden grow? How is the garden of your heart growing? Is it thorny? Does it need some weeding? How does your garden grow? Winter is actually a really good time for those of us who want a garden in the spring to be thinking about that, to be enriching the soil. Now, some of you are saying my garden is sleeping right now uh, beneath a thick layer of uh, of snow. That's okay, too. Um, maybe, maybe right now um, the garden of your heart is in a season of resting. Maybe this is a stillness and silent season of solitude for the garden of your heart. It's okay too. Resting in God and resting with God is um, good, good exercise for the spirit as well. Uh, I want you to think today about God as the master gardener and what it what it looks like for you as a human being to let God till the soil of your heart. Like tilling the soil, um, you know, like actually like sticking a blade in there and um, turning turning the soil over. Um, have you noticed that in the spring, your garden, when you till it the first time, produces rocks? Mm-hmm. And what do you do with those? Well, if you're a good gardener, you you take the rocks to the to the edge of the garden, right? To the edge of the field. Um, you you plow them up and you carry them off. That's actually why um, so many ancient gardens and old gardens have border walls. Those border walls are just actually constructed over time. Uh, from all of the rocks that, quote, grew up um, in that garden, came up to the surface over time. And so maybe if you've been a Christian for a while, God wants to retill the soil of your heart um, to reveal some rocks that have come up over time. Maybe that's what God wants to do in the garden of your heart today. God's the master gardener. He wants to till the soil of our hearts. He wants to remove the rocks, purify Um, sift, sort. He wants to plant the word in in us. The the word of God is described in scripture as a seed. So God wants to plant the seed of his word in your heart. Are you hiding the word of God in your heart? Are you allowing it to be planted deep within you? Where in the word are you today? And where in you is the word? Are you receiving the Um, living water that God is pouring out today? Does God want to water the garden of your parched heart today? How about turning toward him as he shines the light of his love over your life? We, we, We pray for and ask God's blessing and he is sure and certain to give it. Lord, um, bless and keep. Lord, make your face to shine upon us. Lord, lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace. If God is shining the light of his uh, of His glory upon your life, do you have your back turned to him? Or is your heart garden wide open um, to the light 
and the beauty of God's face and his countenance. Yeah, that's a revealing look, right? If I'm going to turn toward God and open my heart garden to his uh, penetrating light, I recognize that that's going to shine into the dark corners, right? Mm -hmm. And that's going to require repentance, confession and repentance that God might cleanse and purify. But that's good for me. And it's glorifying to him. So I'm going to invite us to turn our heart gardens over to God, the master gardener today. Invite him to prune us. Because God wants to cultivate for himself a harvest of righteousness in and through our lives. That's what he wants to do as the master gardener. And so you may see, you may say to yourself, well, this is the time of year that, you know, gardens lie fallow. We don't, we don't till them up. We don't turn them over. Yeah. God actually wants to garden in your heart year round. Um, and today he wants you to examine the fruit that is being produced in the garden of your heart. So Galatians chapter five is, uh, where we take today's growing your faith verse of the day or where we find it. Um, and we're going to read Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and I hope that this is a seed of God's Word that's already planted deep in your heart. Scripture memorization is going to be one of the things we're going to talk about today when Robert Morgan joins us at the end of the second hour. Um, but the Growing Your Faith verse of the day is designed to be something that every single day you literally, you plant it, you receive it into yourself that it might take root and it might grow up and flourish. So. As we read Galatians 5, 22 and 23 today, I want to invite you to allow God to plant this seed of his word in the garden of your heart and let him have his way in producing a harvest of righteousness unto himself. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, Paul says. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things, Paul says. So the Holy Spirit is producing this fruit in us. We are not producing this ourselves. The seed of God's word planted in the soil of a human heart, um, watered with the living water, saturated with the light of God's merciful love, um, rising up, in new life to produce a harvest of righteousness to the glory of God. Like that's one image of the Christian life that you might um, consider and think about today. And what kind of fruit does God intend to gather into his harvest from our lives? God wants to harvest love and joy, peace and patience, kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the kinds of fruits that God wants to receive from the bounty of our lives. So today, we invite the master gardener to till the soil of our hearts, to plant the seed of his word deep within, by the power of the Holy Spirit to work within our hearts to cultivate for himself a harvest of righteousness, described as these good fruits in Galatians chapter 5. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LeBurge, and we're going to talk next about an experience I had yesterday at a crosswalk in uh, downtown Orlando, and we're going to use it as an opportunity to talk about our crosswalk. How's your crosswalk going today? That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Are you familiar with the story of the country mouse that goes to the city or the city mouse that goes to the country? Paul Perot, which uh, which one of those? The country mouse that goes to the city or the city mouse that goes to the country? Well, I was the country mouse that went to the city. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. I grew so up So I but yeah. I am the country mouse who uh is in the city. And uh so I traveled to uh the city of Orlando um in order to share some time yesterday speaking um with some with some Christians into the political polarization of our day. And um, and so that meant at some point I had to like walk like down the city streets from one location to another location, uh, in this case, from my hotel to the 
the event site, <clears throat> there's not a big church in, well, big, I don't know, it's a physically big church. I don't actually know congregationally how big it is. There you go. It's a beautiful old church. But I am a country mouse. And in the country, it's like go to the stop sign, turn right at the, you know, at the farmer's market, turn left. When you see the um, black and white Oreo cows, you know, you're 100 feet from the gravel driveway. Like these are Carmen-like instructions to get from here to there. But that is not how that works in a city. In a city, it's like, you know, go two blocks east, turn, you know, turn north, go six blocks. Um, you know, I, it's like, it, it, anyway, I am a country mouse. I am totally happy to tell you that, that I'm a country mouse. I actually find cities very disorienting. And after yesterday's experience, I <laughs> say, I pretty much just in the future, need a guide. I just need to take a, I, a human being needs to go with me who knows the way from here to there because I, I am, I'm not lost, lost, but I'm basically lost in a city. So of course you say to yourself, but you've got your phone and on your phone, you've got a map and you can tell it that you want to walk from here to there. Yes, I had that. And I was still standing on a street corner yesterday, literally, literally like looking in all four directions completely immobilized. Like I'm, and so finally I realized I shouldn't be standing this close to the curb looking in each of these directions because I actually like appear totally lost, which I think in my mind is not a good way to appear in any urban environment. So there you go. So <clears throat> I'm standing at this crosswalk um, and I'm clearly lost. I'm turned around. I had the tools. Yes. Yes, it's one thing to have the tools. It's another thing to have enough of like sense of direction, <laughs> sense of direction, to know what that map that you're holding in your hands actually means. So there you go. <clears throat> I um, I was uh, yeah, I was disoriented. I was lost. That's that'll be my. So I started to become a little overcome with anxiety. Which t this is the only, like when I say that this is the only time and place that this happens to me. This is the time and place that I regularly experience anxiety, like this onset of I'm, I don't know how to get to where I'm supposed to be. <clears throat> so if you've ever been there, you're probably feeling it right now. It's uncomfortable. So I decided, you know what, I'm just going to sit down on this bus bench that's here at this corner and I'm going to take a minute. And so I, I prayed and I said, God, I, just, <laughs> I need like... I need you. I I mean, every moment I need you, but like, I, I like really need you in this moment. I have all the tools right here. I'm actually, I actually know I'm only a few blocks from where I'm supposed to be, but I'm disoriented. I'm turned around. I don't have a, a good sense of direction. Like help me. And when I looked back down at my phone, instead of the map, which I found utterly disorienting to look at, um, a little notification popped up. Uh, if you're like me, you're subscribed to all kinds of things. And one of those things that um, I'm uh, subscribed to is a, a devotional. That it, just, it just like popped in that that little thing had was in my email. And so I thought, all right, I'm just going to go read it because I needed some, I needed something, right? So it was a devotional related to the season of Lent. Um, and it was about the way of the cross, the 14 stations of the cross, the path that Jesus walked through the city of Jerusalem to the cross. Um, yes, I know it's extra biblical in terms of the precise 14 stations and how they're outlined, but I've walked that. I have walked the Via Della Rosa in Jerusalem. I have walked the stations of the cross in, um, in church gardens and courtyards um, around the United States of America. I have walked the, um, the stations of the cross in a fellowship hall where people just, you know, put, put up markers um, on the wall and and you have an opportunity to stop in the places that Jesus stopped and read the passages of scripture that are related to the experiences that he had from the point of his arrest um, all the way through uh, carrying the cross to Golgotha. And let me tell you, revisiting the Stations of the Cross, sitting there um, on that bench yesterday was, um, was a healing balm to me. My anxiety all went away. Um, and I still didn't have any greater sense of how to get from where I was to where I needed to be. <clears throat> but I, um, I did experience the present ministry of 
of God. And that's such a gift, right? So I don't really know how long I sat there contemplating, you know, the crosswalk of Christ, right? The way of cross, uh, the way of the cross, um, Jesus's crosswalk, as I sat there at that crosswalk in downtown Orlando. Um, but, you know, after some period of contemplation, I looked up, like at the crosswalk in front of me, and there's people heading in all four directions, right? Um, from the corner where I was sitting. And I just, like, these questions just started populating my mind. Like, who are these people? Where have they been? Where are they going? Who among them is like me journeying to Jerusalem with Jesus during this season of Lent? Who among them are my brothers and sisters in Christ? And who among them don't know the way of the cross? How many of them are walking totally disoriented in this world, in this life? They don't know where they're going, and they certainly don't know how to get there. They don't know the way to the Father. Like I was, it was just one of those, like, God opened my eyes that I might see where I am and see people differently and see this crosswalk that, you know, people are, people are traversing in all directions, headed in, headed in all directions. Like, just help me see this moment in a different way. So, um, I, one particular person caught my attention and it, it, this individual like looked physically burdened. They weren't carrying anything that you could like see, but they're carrying something. You, you know, this, they're like weighed down. And that led me to just ask the Lord, you know, what cross is every single one of these people carrying today? Right. Every single day, you and I pick up our cross and we walk. Um, and God gives us the, the power and the ability to do that, even in the midst of the burdens of this life. So um, at this crosswalk yesterday, <clears throat> I finally was just like, okay, all right, God, I got I to gotta get on to where I'm supposed to be. And so I just asked God to sort of give me my bearings. Again, I wasn't lost, lost. But, you know, I was a little bit lost. And that's when this guy crossed um, crossed at the crosswalk. And literally, he's just like, nobody else looked me in the eye the whole time. And all of a sudden, like, he sees me and I see him. Like, there's that eye contact moment, right? And with the broadest smile you could imagine, I think probably to make, put me at ease and comfort because, you know, strange man, strange street, strange city, you know, strange lady. Yeah, that'd be me. Um, he just smiled really broadly and said, are you lost? And I said, well, I'm not lost, lost, but I don't know which way to go. And he laughed and he said, I got you. I, I got you. Um, where are you headed? And so I told him and with absolute confidence, I mean, with, with total confidence, he turned in one of the four options, like, right. He turned directly down one street and he pointed and he said, and he pointed like with authority, you know, you could like point casually or, you know, and then you could like point. He like pointed with authority. He's like, walk that way until you get to Washington, turn left and you will run right into it. It's two blocks up the hill. And I smiled and I thanked him and I said, wait, hill, <laughs> like there can't possibly be a real hill here. Cause I'm like, I'm in downtown Orlando. It is like flat as a pancake. Although this pancake has a, has a lump, uh, which I learned yesterday. So he smiled and he said, okay, you are headed to the oldest church in the city. It is on the only hill, on the only hill we got. It's not a big hill, but it's the highest point in the city that they could find at the time. It actually started as the house, a uh, house church of the grandson of Thomas Jefferson. It's beautiful. You're going to love it. The building was designed by the same firm that designed the National Cathedral in D.C. And I'm thinking to myself, like, are you like the city ambassador? Like, are you the tour guide? And he laughed and he said, I'm adding that to my resume, ambassador of the city. And I thought, I have met a fellow brother in Christ. God has blessed me with a saint who knows the way that I need to go. So anyway, um, uh, we, we parted company and, uh, and he was exactly right. I walked in the direction that he had pointed I got to Washington, I turned left, and, and there it was, up, up the hill. Not, not a big hill, but, you know, the only hill they got in downtown Orlando. All right, you're listening to Mornings with Carmen. I am Carmen LeBurge. I hope you are journeying with me this morning on the way of the cross. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen, and we'll be right back. What season of life are you in right now? 
season of life, there are lots of ways to answer that question. So what season of life are you in right now? You may feel as if you are in a season of hopeful expectation or a season of desperation. You may feel as if you are in a dry season or a rainy season or maybe a season of abundance. Maybe this is a transitional season for you. What season of life are you in right now? Let me say first that you're not alone in whatever season you are in. And let me also say that God wants to meet you and be with you in that current season, even in that season of wilderness or dryness. And God wants to lead you through that current season to the next one. Discover what God is doing in your life now and where he's leading next at this year's Set Apart Conference for Women. It's March 8 and 9 at the University of Northwestern St. Paul. You can register today at setapartconference.com. That's setapartconference.com. All right, thank you uh, to those of you who are asking, hey, what are the Stations of the Cross? That's not something that I know. That's not something that I've ever done. Um, so uh, the Via Della Rosa is, um, is the language for it. And um, it's actually in the old city of Jerusalem. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a pilgrimage route. Um, over the course of history, uh, the, the route has actually taken different, um, different courses. Um, Via Crucis, or the Way of the Cross, is another name for it. And, um, and so the Stations of the Cross refers to a liturgical practice of using the events in the final hours of Jesus's life as like a structure for prayer and meditation. It's basically a, a prayer walk or a meditation walk to walk with Jesus um, along, along the way he walked from, I like, I like to do it from like the events of the last supper. Um, so you would start at the upper room and you would make your way then through the events that follow, through the Kidron Valley, over to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, you would spend time there. You would then um, walk the way of, of Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane through his series of trials. And eventually you would arrive at um, the, the place where Pilate lived in the days of the Roman occupation of Israel. Now, most people start there. Because that other part would have you crisscrossing the city, um, you you would it'd be a long walk, and so a lot of people just start at the uh, out at Pilate at the home of Pilate Pontius Pilate, and they go from there um, through the uh, through the events um, that lead to and culminate at the site of Golgotha. Others extend it from Golgotha to the tomb to the garden tomb, and so. Um, the pilgrimage that you might uh, that you might walk with Jesus, the way of sorrow, the way of the cross, um, would take you through that journey. And so, the stations are associated with specific events that um, that are recounted in the Gospels. Now, you're going to say to yourself, some of those stops along the Via Della Rosa or the Way of the Cross, the Via Crucis. You know they're not expressly lined out in scripture in ways that um, that we know exactly where they took place, um, and and yet you can infer that these events took place because of what what we are told in scripture. So um, Christ is condemned; the cross is laid upon him. Um, he falls. Um, Somewhere along the uh, along that way, there is uh, Simon of Cyrene, who bears the cross. There is this uh, sixth station of the cross where Jesus's face is wiped by Veronica. Yeah, that's not in the Bible, um, but you could imagine something like that happening. Jesus falls again. He meets uh, the women of Jerusalem. He falls again. He is stripped of his garments. Now that one, the 10th station, you could spend a lot of time at the 10th station because we do know a lot about what happens when he is uh, in the custody of the Roman guard and they are um, 
stripping him of his dignity. <clears throat> and and then what they do, um, gambling for his garments and on and on and on. His crucifixion, his death, the words he speaks from the cross, and then ultimately his death upon the cross, his body taken down from the cross, and Jesus laid in the tomb. The way of the cross or the stations of the cross might be um, might be a meditative prayer practice that you want to incorporate into this season of Lent at some point. Um, I have found it to be um, to be a particular blessing. There's probably a church in your community that has a uh, uh, a stations of the cross set up during the season of Lent for meditative walking. It's done. It's done in silence, by the way. So uh, normally you walk, you walk in, and you get a little booklet that they're providing, and they're going to give you some direction in terms of in their in their particular facility or on their particular campus where the stations are laid out and and how you would locate them. So I just encourage you to um, check that out. You may have to go to a Catholic church in order to um, have this experience. Um, or an Anglican church, some Episcopal congregations do this. So I just encourage you to um, to find a church that invites you into this experience. And if you've never done it, um, just meditate your way through it. And, and I totally recognize, like the wiping of Jesus's face by Veronica. I know that's not in the Bible, but could you allow your holy imagination to walk with Jesus in in this route? Um, in the way of the cross, and take a crosswalk with Jesus. That might be my encouragement to you today. Our, our brother Dan DeWitt is going to join us next, um, and we're going to we're going to talk about silent confession. <clears throat> what is the what's your last experience of confession? When's the last time you went to confession? What's the last thing you confess? To whom did you confess? What about spending some time in silent confession as we enter into this season of Lent? Dan DeWitt joins us next. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Our brother Dan DeWitt is back. You can find what we're talking about today at Theolatte.com. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Carmen. What's crackalacking? Hey, man, it's a good day in the kingdom of God. The king is on the throne. Jesus has risen. He's risen indeed. Um, we are invited to walk with him in life, come what may. Um, yeah, empowered by the Holy Spirit, in communion with my brothers and sisters. You know, even though life is hard, yeah. um, we're dancing. I hear that. Amen to all that. But, Carmen, I have to tell you, can I be honest for a second, for just yeah. a little second? You don't like to I dance. I feel old. Well, no, mm. I do like to dance, actually. I'm not really good. But did you know that this week is the 33-year anniversary of the debut of my favorite TV show from my youth, The Wonder Years? Really? Yes. And so it, it came out in 1988, and it depicted events that were 20 years prior to. So that would have been mm. 1968. So if we had a similar show today, it would be depicting events from 2001. Was there um, was there ever a baby born in the show? I didn't watch it. I mean, I am familiar with it, you know, as a cultural touch point. But if there was a baby born and it was a look back to 1968, that, it might have been me. Wow. I'm just saying it's possible I was a character in the Wonder Years and we just don't know it. That would be so awesome. That would be, and well, so <laughs> I'm just that, trying to redeem the fact that you're feeling old because now you're feel, now you're thinking, oh well, she's goodness. older than me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you're right. But Jesus is on His throne. So, amen. There's the amen. Good, that's the good side. Yeah. What um What would you like to silently confess this morning? But you know, it's a talk show, so you can't silently confess it. What is this conversation yes. about silent confession? Well, that's true. You know, so there there are moments where we need to just silently confess things to the Lord, um, sometimes just to be in silence in the Lord's presence and to allow his spirit to commune with us and to advocate for us with words that we, you know, we can't even express ourselves and to convict us, as you talked about earlier. Um, but then there are other times. So silence can be a very good thing and it's neglected um, in so many ways. I know in my life, I don't 
have enough quiet moments where I just stop and really focus on what the Lord would have to say to me. But there are other times where silence is not good, um, where in our silence, we allow things to be said that are not helpful, that are not true. And so we we sit back and passively receive things that we should confront. And now I'm not saying that we should always confront everything. There, there are times where it's appropriate or inappropriate. And sometimes if someone's being foolish, everyone around the table knows they're being foolish and you don't need to correct them per se. But what I I wrote a, a piece called My Silent Confession. Um, it's just a short post, and it's kind of a reflection on a quote from the influential 19th century British pastor, Charles Spurgeon, who once said, few men repent of being silent. And those words are so powerful if you'll think about it, because how often do we repent for those times when we should have said something? Um, in fact, I, I think in our culture and often in Christian subculture, the silent person is assumed to be the company person. They're the one who's not rocking the boat. Sometimes being silent will get you promoted. Sometimes being silent will, will make it look like you're a team player. And if you speak up, um, often that makes you be one of the divergents, one of the people who wants to rock the boat. And it, it act actually can hurt your standing within a community. But nonetheless, um, we're called to speak. And so I, of course, had to go to, if anyone's thinking about the way I'm thinking about this, you might be reminded of the um, episode in Acts that Paul talks about in Galatians, where he opposes Peter. And because Peter would eat with Gentiles um, until his Jewish brothers came around, and then he would back away um, and mm -hmm. he would shy away from that practice. And so Paul says, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. Those are strong words. Um, and then Paul goes on to say that the reason that, that Peter and others were doing this um, was because of hypocrisy and because of fear. So he calls them essentially hypocrites and cowards. And so in reflecting on Spurgeon's quote and thinking about what Paul did, Paul, I mean, was willing to risk his standing in the community to do what was right. And so in this post, I list a few things that times I was silent and I shouldn't have been silent. And so my encouragement to anyone who reads it or is listening today, let's, let's ask the Spirit to give us wisdom and discernment um, and boldness for the times when we should speak that we wouldn't remain silent. A couple of observations. I was reminded yesterday that um, those of us who, because of our social location, um, have the privilege of an amplified voice, whatever that may be. Um, sometimes your voice is amplified because of your position in an organization. Sometimes your position is amplified um, because of the the relational um, or the relationships that you have. Like you have um, power in an environment because of who you are. And for you to keep silent when somebody who does not have that kind of position, someone who does not have that kind of relational power, for you to keep silent um, is, is sinful. Like it's like literally sinful. And I'm All right. Looks like we lost Carmen there, Dan. <laughs> uh, so I'm still here. I assumed I was lost. I yeah, you're you're fine. I uh, if, if you want to, I don't know where she was going with that because unfortunately I had I was distracted. But maybe you want to continue on your <laughs> on the train of thought here with your article. You want me to keep talking? Yeah, go keep talking. Yeah. Okay. We're on the air. Well, I think we, I, I think we've lost Carmen. And I, I believe that whole conversation we just had with Paul is still live. I now have the show. I have the wheel. At the moment, until, yes. Un until I hear Carmen. Um, Carmen was, I believe, saying that, you know, talking about these moments where we need to speak because we have a platform. And she's absolutely right. And that's one of the things I've hit on in this piece is that to be silent um, should not be an option at times. And I think we need to have wisdom and discernment here. Everyone knows someone who's reckless with their words, who's unbridled in what they say. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the moment, as I described here, where I was as a young man in a room filled with white Christian leaders, 
And there was an internationally known Bible preacher who made a disparaging comment about a church that he recently preached at, an all-Black church, related to their cultural practices, just what was the norm of their worship services. And in that moment, I looked over at a colleague, we exchanged a look, raised our eyebrows, and we knew that even though this was an internationally known speaker, whose name I won't give because everyone would know the name, we knew that was wrong. It was wrong. Um, and we stayed silent. We should have said something. The young guys in the room, um, not the ones with authority, not the ones with influence, but but there were other people um, we care about who would be deeply hurt if they heard those comments and even more hurt, perhaps, by the fact that we said nothing. And so in this post, I, I, I repent of my silent moments to play off of what Spurgeon said, um, that few men repent of silence. Let's be the kind of people who not only repent of silence, but who commit ourselves to the next time that we're in the room where the inappropriate comment is made, that we're going to speak up. And like the Apostle Paul, that may not make us popular. And in the moment, we'll probably second guess ourselves, but it's listening to that inner, that still small inner voice that says, that's not right. And as Carmen said, if we have the opportunity to speak and we have a platform that our voice might be amplified, all the more reason to speak up and say something. All right. <laughs> Good point. In here. We're still trying to get a hold of Carmen here. So tell you what, we're going to go to a break, Dan. And then when we come back, we'll continue our conversation here on uh, mornings, unfortunately, at the moment without Carmen. But hopefully Carmen Mor- coming back. Mornings with Daniel. <laughs> there you go. We'll go with that. Mornings with, uh, <laughs> with Daniel here on Faith Radio. 150 million people, 150 million people actively use one particular app every month in the United States of America. I want that to be the Faith Radio app. How about you? If you're wondering how you could be encouraged in your faith at any time, anywhere, well, I got good news for you. There's literally an app for that. You can listen to Faith Radio live, any show on demand, no matter where you are at any time of the day or night. Download the free Faith Radio app right now. It's super easy. Just text the word app to 877-933-2484 and click the link. Let's connect faith to life. Well, nothing like the radio host going silent during a conversation about not being silent. But there you go. I don't know what happened. I was still talking and then you guys weren't there. Uh, Dan DeWitt is here with us, and apparently you cleaned up the mess that I left behind. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Just trying to do I, my if, part. <laughs> if I were a conspiracy theorist, if I were a conspiracy theorist, um, apparently the part of what I said that didn't get aired was that Alexei Navalny um, has died in a Russian prison. And that is an important opposition voice that has now fallen silent. So I will reserve that for a later conversation. Um, But you missed it, and now I've said it out loud, and I'm pretty sure you heard it. It's no longer Um, silent. No longer silent. Um, Talk with us about uh, justification. What does that word mean for people that don't know? Um, And and what uh, what is this conversation about justified true belief? Yeah. So, you know, we often think of the word justification as it relates to, you know, the alignment of your text in a document, you know, is it right justified or left justified? And then we also think about it in terms of theological categories. I mean, Martin Luther, who said this of other doctrines, by the way, but he he's often quoted as saying that the doctrine of justification is the doctrine upon which the church will stand or fall. Um, and he's right because it relates to, and again, as a friend of mine who's a Luther scholar points out, that that's not the only doctrine Luther said it of, Martin Luther said it of, the Protestant reformer. Um, But the doctrine of justification is, relates to how we are, a person's made right with God. Is it based on our good works, our good deeds, the things we do, our own moral aptitude, or is it based on the righteousness of Christ and the, the gift of grace that we receive through faith? Now, as it relates to belief, the term justif- justification or justified true belief relates to your reasoning. Do you have good reasons? Are you justified in believing what you believe? And this is a theory of truth that I find really helpful. Um, I think it's I, I think that there's good reasons to see this theory as being reflective 
of Christian belief, although it wasn't designed for Christian belief, but it essentially boils down to three um, criteria for something counting as true knowledge. And so for you to have true knowledge, for your belief to actually be knowledge, you know, obviously, if you believe something that's not true, it's not knowledge, you know, it's it's foolishness. Um, it's empty. But if for, for there to be true knowledge, something has to be true, you actually have to believe it. So there are things that are true that we may not believe, um, and we don't have knowledge of those things. We may be ignorant of them. We may just not know. And so therefore, we don't have true knowledge of that particular thing that does happen to be true. But then the third criteria is that we have to have good reasons for believing it. So for example, on Sunday, um, almost a week ago now, my son, Josiah, my third born son, who's 13, who is a ball of energy and passion and and charm and charisma and all of the, all the stuff. Um, Josiah proudly declared Sunday morning, the Chiefs will win the Super Bowl. And I'm like, OK, uh, they're not who I wanted to be in the Super Bowl, but fine. Um, I want a Green Bay to make it, but OK, whatever. And I didn't really differ with him on that because I think they probably would win the Super Bowl. And Sunday night, we stayed up in, for the overtime. We let the kids stay up late and the Chiefs won. Did my son have true knowledge that morning? No. It was true that they won. He believed they were going to win. And it, of course, turned out to be true. But it was a guess. He was lucky. It could have went the other way. In fact, at one point, it looked like it would go the other way. But in true Chiefs fashion, they overcame the obstacles. They came back and they won in overtime. Um, however, when my son said he believed it, he didn't have true knowledge. So what we need to do when we think about belief is, do I believe a thing? Is it true? And do I have good reasons for believing it? And as Christians, as we sense our justification kind of being challenged, maybe we re believe something because of authority. Someone we trust told us to believe this. And then maybe they are a part of a scandal. And then we doubt our belief. Well, we may just have poor justification for our belief, but that doesn't mean the belief isn't true. We might have other reasons that we believe a thing. We might believe it because it brings us joy at a certain moment in our life. But then if we find ourselves in a season of despair, does that mean it's no longer true? Um, hmm. What we need to do is constantly investigate and listen to our doubts and our challenges so that we're un not unaware of the foundation of our belief being eroded because we're not dealing honestly with our doubts. So I say a whole lot more about that theory, but I think it's really, really a helpful way to think about how we form our beliefs. That's really good. I um I think that even just today, like we could, I mean, I, you know, I'm I'm always working on a document of one kind or another. This even this question of you know justified right, justified left, or justified center, like that's a mm. good, that's a good conversational point mm. to uh, to till in conversation with other people because it's a concept that we, like, you could actually set up your you know, your messages that you send to somebody today and you could like justify them all <laughs> to the right instead of to the left, because, you yeah. know, reading a message that's all justified right would be a little disorienting because everybody sends mm. left justified messages. Everybody. Except in text messages, sometimes they're right justified, aren't they? Anyway, you get my point, like, right? It would be. <laughs> I, yeah. And like poetry is like center justified, but mm -hmm. not like regular stuff. Like all of our paragraph stuff is justified to the left, isn't it? You're you're so. a you're a college professor person. Like, don't you expect people to turn in a paper that's justified to the left? You know, I wonder. I've never even looked into this. I wonder if the style guides tell you the left justified. They probably do. I just assume people are going to do that. But if you're yeah, reading in another it, language, like Hebrew yeah. or Arabic, it's going to be right justified, right? Like because you're reading from right to left, which turns out is kind of hard. I didn't do well in Hebrew. Did you? Everything at yeah, actually Hebrew is is my was my jam. Hebrew was my jam. Really? Greek, oh, I found very, man. very difficult. Hebrew is like math, which it's not that I'm good at math, but I'm good it at It is memorizing. like math, yeah. I, I was then. Yeah. Because all I'm you have to do is find those Latin. three you gotta find those it's three letters. Rute. <laughs> you just gotta find those three <laughs> letters. <laughs> and then and then you just gotta figure out what's attached to them on the front and the back and where the vowel points are. Like it's not, yeah, it's 
Hebrew, I've I mean, met, but I, Hebrew I is you got to you got to turn to the back of the what feels like the back of the book, and then you have to read from right to left, and you have to turn pages. It's a very it's a good thing to retrain your brain if you want to retrain your brain. Take a course in Hebrew because the whole exercise is from right to left instead of from left to right, and it's just yeah. Well, there you go, justified. <laughs> It's all Greek. Do you know that uh, everything at theolatte.com is center justified? Is that yes. on purpose? Yeah, I'm trying to have a, I'm trying to show a middle way. <laughs> I'm giving people now, like, if someone wants like ammo for challenging my convictions, I probably just gave it to them. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, Daniel DeWitt, not justified right or justified left, justified right down the middle. <clears throat> no, but I mean, I you know, think. we're justified in Jesus. There's a justification conversation. I could have some fun with this. I am having yeah. fun with this, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Uh, morning conversations should it. be fun and, um, and mine are powered by, uh, by coffee. And so I like it. Theolatte.com <laughs> is where you can find the worldview reader. You can find the, uh, the things that we talked about with Dan today and a whole lot more. Um, Dan, thanks so much for being with us as always. My pleasure. Take care, Carmen. Absolutely. Um, the power of one, the power of one voice, the power of one voice silenced um, in terms of the conversations of the day. If you don't know the name Alexei Navalny, um, you will become familiar with it today. Um, he is a Russian opposition leader, uh, outspoken critic of Putin and the Kremlin, made global headlines um, four years ago when the Russian government poisoned him. Um, and he uh, has been in prison, and that is where the Russian prison service has announced that he has died. Um, 47 years old, a, a voice critical of Putin and critical of the Kremlin, silenced. Um, my guess is that other voices will now rise up, but, you know, this is 47 years ago, Mrs. Navalny, you know, held little Alexi in her arms. And every time someone um, dies, you know, there's a mother who grieves. And so we're going to grieve today with those who grieve. We're going to pray that God lifts up um, another voice, maybe many, to be amplified where this one voice has been silenced, um, because truth needs to stand up to power. Um, and the way truth finds a voice in the world is through people like you and me. So um, let today be the day that you do not keep silent uh, in the face of tyranny. Let it not be the day that you keep silence when God has given you a voice to, to lift up um, in opposition sometimes to what's going on in the world. You are, uh, you are listening to Mornings with Carmen. We do have another hour together up next. We're going to have the Friday Farm Report. We are going to talk um, with Paul Acey about some things going on in the world of entertainment, including a message from Barney. In terms of blasts from the past today, Barney might be our biggest purple blast from the past. Um, and then Robert Morgan is going to join us, and we're going to talk about the 100 Bible verses everyone should know by heart. Are you memorizing scripture this year? Is that a part of your um, spiritual discipline practice and plan? If not, I'm going to commend it to you. Let us be meditating on the word of God. Let the seed of the word be planted deeply within us that it might not only take root, but produce a, um, a flourishing harvest of righteousness to the glory of of the Lord our God. We've got another hour together up next. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LeBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.